Hey, what's going on guys and welcome to another episode of Building on WordPress. My name is Josh Donnelly and as you guys know, I am a huge fan of the Cornerstone Builder by Themeco and yesterday they just launched the beta of a really nice update. So in today's video, I'm hoping to breeze through some of the primary new features that have been added in. As you can see here, there are quite a few in the change log. There's also been updates and bug fixes and all of those kind of things, but we're going to take a look at like the 50,000 foot view of some of the new things that have been added in into Cornerstone. Like I said, I'm going to breeze over things, so this isn't necessarily a tutorial, but more of just a news flash so that you guys can kind of see what is on the horizon. Now, keep in mind that this is still in beta and it's still in only a day old beta, so a lot of this is subject to change or interfaces might change and things like that. So just keep that in mind as we are running through things. So without further ado, let's jump over to Cornerstone here. Now, I already have the beta installed here. So let's take a look at some of the new features. First things first, you're going to notice that there is now a cog right down here for your preferences and the preferences pop up in a separate pane that can be moved around and adjusted as needed. I think this is really nice just because you can kind of get this out of the way, but also get to it very easily by simply clicking on this cog here. Now, if that doesn't work for you or you don't like that in your workspace, not a problem at all. Within the preferences, you can actually just toggle on or off whether you want the preferences to show up in the toolbar. And if you toggle it off, then you're just going to get to it the old fashioned way by simply clicking on this little preferences cog here which then opens this up for you you also have your shortcuts and your support tabs as well you'll also notice some additional features within the settings here which is really nice one of them being your default element so what do you want your starting element to be a section is what has been standard but you can also select a row a div grid, what have you. And that's always going to be your starter element. So what does that mean? Well, if I come over here and I click start from scratch, the first thing that I'm going to get when I do that is a grid because I have grid selected as my starter container. But if you just want that to be set to the default, you can simply come into preferences and you can set that to section. And now when you create a new section, we'll click on from scratch here, we get the standard layout. So that's super nice. Now, another really nice feature in the preferences, let's go ahead and jump back into that here, is the ability to turn on or off the open library as default. So what that means is if we go ahead and add a column here, we are always going to see add element and get the selector. Even if we go back to our outline here and we click it here, normally this would have been add a section and you'd hold down command or control to get the add element. Now it just by default has add element. And if you don't like that, same kind of thing, you just come into your preferences here and you simply turn off open library default. And now when you come over here, you have add row. And if you're in your outline here, you have add section. And to get the add element, you hold down the command or control key, and then you can get that same thing there. So nice to have that as an option if you prefer that to just open up the elements pane for you. Another really nice feature is within the code editor. So let's go ahead and just add a text element and use HTML here. So we're going to go ahead and open up our content. You'll notice two things. One, the HTML editor now wraps. So if we have long things in here, they actually wrap down as opposed to just scrolling left and right. And in addition to that, we also now have dynamic content in the code editor, which is super nice. While we're in our dynamic content, you're going to notice a couple of things here as well. Uh, you'll notice our API stuff, which we're going to get to in a moment. But if we scroll all the way down to the bottom, you'll notice that we now have globals for our colors. So these are the colors that you have set up in your global options here. So you'll notice I have white, mid blue, this one, I don't know what it is. So let's give it a color here and a name and set things up like that. Now you'll notice we have our colors here, which also I should add have been fixed. It's a lot easier to drag things around here and arrange things. So let's jump back into our code editor, open up our content, go into our dynamic content, scroll down to the global colors, and you'll notice I now have access to all of my different colors here. I can click on one of those and enter that color in, and it will add in the colors variable ID right here so that that color is now being pulled through. So you'll see that global color showing up right here, which has endless use cases throughout your site. Another really cool feature which can be enabled inside of preferences here, and I'm going to go ahead and just turn on our uh, preference toolbar. So this is a lot easier to get to in this tutorial. So another thing that you can enable here, which is really nice to have access to is your rich text global color. So by default, this is disabled. So let's go ahead and look, this is how it traditionally was. So to take a look at the default format, if we open up our text here and we go into the rich text editor and we were to say, Hey, we want to highlight this, you know, sentence right here and make it a color. 
we would click on the color and we just get the standard default palette here. But the nice thing about this new feature in preferences is that we can open up our preferences, we can scroll down and we can enable use global colors. And I'm going to go ahead and save and I'm going to refresh cornerstone here. And with that refresh, let's go through that same process. Let's open up our content editor, pull up rich text, and let's highlight that sentence there. Now, when I pull up my text color, I have access to my global color palette. Now you do need to keep in mind that these are just the color values themselves. These are not tied to your global palette. So if we were to select something like this red, it is going to make it the red that's in our global color palette. But if you look at the HTML, it is the value of that red. It is not the global color. So if I were to jump into my colors here and I were to change that red, I don't even know which one I chose, but I were to change it to green or something like this here. It is not going to change that color value so this is a static reference of the color but it is super nice to have access to that in the rich text editor another thing that's really nice that's been added in is on all of the off-screen elements so that is your drop downs let's go ahead and add one of those it's also on our modals let's go ahead and add one of those and it's also on our off canvas elements. Now you've probably run into this before where you might have a video inside of a modal and you want that video to stop when the modal is closed. There was always a workaround that we could use, but that is now a native feature again within Cornerstone called dynamic rendering. So if you have some sort of content in here, specifically a video, let's say you have a YouTube embed, you can enable the dynamic rendering, which then means when this is closed, it resets whatever was in there. And that is doable also on the drop down here, dynamic rendering and on the off canvas element as well. So really nice, especially if you're putting videos in there. On that topic, you'll also notice that things like the modal have been slightly redesigned and look a lot better when we get down to mobile sizes, which is really nice. Also, the body scroll and all of that is just going to work much smoother. So little improvements and enhancements along the way as well. You'll also notice in things like the drop down element, we can now choose the position of the drop down. So let's go ahead and add something in here like an alert just so that we have something inside of our drop down. So here's our little alert. And this is the standard way that a drop down was used. It's set to position auto. But if we want to force it, we can set top left and that will now move to the top left. We can do bottom left and that'll move to the bottom left. I'm going to go ahead and leave this set to auto. In addition to that, you'll now notice that if we enable the hover trigger, we now get interval timeout and sensitivity to this button and how this button would interact if we had other buttons next to it. So what's the hover going from one button to the other. So nice to be able to have access to those things there as well. Uh, another great little addition is in the accordion. So let's go ahead and add our accordion here. And you will notice that within the accordion, we now have scroll with, and by default, it is set to none. We can do mobile and we can do all. And that scroll with is how do you want the page to scroll when an accordion is opened? So for example, if we go down to mobile here and we open an accordion, it's kind of pushing things off screen. If we wanted to, we can click on that accordion and say scroll with mobile. And now when I click on accordion item one, it's gonna scroll down to that item or accordion item two, it's gonna scroll down to that item as well. So again, little quality of life improvements. I think that is a great feature. Let's go ahead and jump back to our desktop view here. Now, as you guys know, I'm a huge fan of looper providers and consumers because really the sky's the limit with those things. So let's come into our main container here on the column. We'll go customize and we'll enable our looper provider. Now we've always had access to the query builder, but it has been greatly improved. So if we go ahead and open up the query builder, you're going to notice that we can now choose our post type. So let's go ahead and set this to something like location. And then we could set taxonomies, we could set authors, and now we have access to meta values. And within meta values, we can get pretty complex. We can say this is an and or an or relation, and then we can begin adding our meta values. So we could say meta key is, and I can go through my library here and say something like meta key is sale price exists in like not in all of that kind of stuff for comparison we can then add the meta value in here and this could be dynamic content and if we wanted to we could actually say that we wanted to order our looper by this meta value so we could click order by and say we want it to be descending or ascending so a nice easy way to avoid having to go into the query string editor and write a query string yourself so i think this is a great improvement here now, in addition to the new query builder, we can also open this up and we can scroll down and you'll notice we actually have some new looper provider types. We have our CSV, we have external API and external global API. You're only going to see these ones if you go into the cornerstone settings and make sure that you have external API enabled. 
we're going to jump back over here and we're going to say csv you can provide a source file here so you can link to a file by url or whatever or use dynamic content you can specify whether or not that csv file has a header and what the delimiter is on it so again great for powering a lot of things but especially cs charts and then we can also create external APIs or access or global APIs. Theoretically, if you just wanted to set up a, a simple API here at this level, we could set up our API here with an endpoint, a path, what kind of method we're using with that API, like a get method here, whether we want to add any headers, what we're requesting, what our return type is, a data key, et cetera, et cetera. But another really convenient way to do this is to jump up into our globals. And from the globals, we're going to scroll all the way down to the bottom here. We can create global endpoints. And you'll notice I have one in here called test. So we can open up test and we can see that I've given it a name. So we can just call this anything, right? We'll call this building on WordPress test. So I can give it any sort of name so that I can easily find this in the future. I'm setting this to run. So it is active. Our endpoint is the Pokemon API endpoint here. And I just got this from the theme code docs. We're not going to specify a path because the path is specified here. Our method is a get method uh, requesting attributes, return type, JSON, data key. We want the results. So that's the data key we're using to access the uh, Pokemon API cache time. We could set this to something. I'm just going to do 10 minutes here so that it's set up. And I think everything else looks pretty good. So once I have this generally configured here globally, so all I have to do to use this in the future is go to whatever page I want to create that looper provider on. So let's go ahead. I think we already have provider on this column. We'll go ahead and click customize. We'll scroll down. And instead of kind of building a one-off API here where we have to enter all this information in, I'm going to change the provider to our API global. And now all I have to do is access that BOWP test API that we set up globally. It's going to pull through all of our defaults. If I need to specify something different, so instead of results, I wanted this to grab, uh, you know, characters or something like that. I could specify that here. So this is where we can then get more granular. But for the sake of this example, I don't even need to do that. Now, once I have all of this set up, I could create a consumer. So let's go ahead and let's actually get rid of this stuff here. Uh, everything inside and uh, in our column, let's actually go to our row just for the sake of example here, set it to three. And here we're going to pull through a headline and we want that column to be a consumer. So we're going to go ahead and turn that on. So to keep things clean here, I actually don't want that looper provider on my column. So I'm going to come in here and turn that off and I'm going to go into the row and inside of the row, I'm going to go to customize. I'm going to enable my looper provider, scroll down to external API and set that to my global building on WordPress API. Now that looks like it's working. So now we'll come in here and you have to know what you're accessing inside of your API. Uh, but what I'm going to go ahead and grab is the looper uh, field. And I believe the Pokemon API has a name of the character. Let's go ahead and try this and we'll click plus and we'll see what comes back and there we go we're starting to get stuff from the api bulbasaur i don't even know all these right but they're they're all coming through so now knowing what you're accessing you, sky's the limit you could pull through images you could pull through more text etc cetera, etc cetera. so really really nice feature that opens up a whole new world of possibilities now again i am only scratching the surface on things that have been added updated fixed etc in the newest version of cornerstone but this is a great beta that has been a lot of fun to play with as always i hope you guys find these videos useful don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to this channel and i will see you guys in the next video peace